Debate on vote number 39, Rural Development and Land Reform Appropriation Bill. I now call upon the Honorable the Minister of Rural Development and Land Reform to introduce his budget vote. The Honorable Minister. Honourable Chair, I've got a couple of home boys on, the, on my left here. So when they make some noises, don't worry. Uh, uh, yeah, no, not you, man. I'm talking about Zambé, uh, the wonderful municipality. Yeah, there you are. Look behind you. Sorry, sorry, Chair. <laughs> honourable, honourable Chair, honourable members of the House, all ministers and deputy ministers present today, members of the portfolio committee, distinguished guests, fellow South Africans. The governing party, the ANC, declared 2017 the year of Oliver Regional Term, the year of unity in action by all South Africans. Together, we continue to move our great country towards the vision of a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic and prosperous society, the strategic objective of the National Democratic Revolution. The Ready to Govern document sets out the ANC's policy objectives as follows. To strive for the achievement of the right of all South Africans as a whole, to political and economic self-determination in a united South Africa to overcome the legacy of inequality and injustice created by colonialism and apartheid in a swift, progressive and principled way, to develop a sustainable econo economy and state infrastructure that will progressively improve the quality of life of all South Africans, to encourage the flourishing of the feeling that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, to, mo to promote a common loyalty to and pride in the country. And finally, to create a universal sense of freedom and security within its borders. In pursuit of these objectives, President Zuma established the National Planning Commission and charged it with the task of putting together a comprehensive national development plan. The National Planning Commission came up with a comprehensive plan, the National Development Plan, Vision 2030, which was widely canvassed among South Africans and was adopted by this august body, the Tribune of the People of South Africa. This National Development Plan was adopted by the governing party, the ANC, in its 53rd National Conference in 2012. The National Development Plan pre prefaces its objectives by the following quote from the Reconstruction and Development Program of 1994. It says, no political democracy can survive and flourish if the masses of our people remain in poverty, without land, without tangible prospects for a better life. Attacking poverty and deprivation must therefore be the first priority of a democratic government. It goes on to say, Developing and upgrading capabilities to enable sustainable and inclusive development requires a new approach and a new mindset. It says, the story, that's the National Development Plan. It says, the story we propose to write involves the following. Creating jobs and livelihoods, expanding infrastructure, transitioning to a low carbon economy, transforming urban and rural spaces, improving education and training, providing quality health care, building a capable state, fighting corruption and enhancing accountability, and transforming society and uniting the nation. That is the National Development Plan. In pursuit of these National Development Plan objectives, Cabinet set up set the following six priorities in its medium term strategic framework 20, 2014 to 2019. Firstly, to improve land administration and spatial planning, 
for integrated development in rural areas. Thus, the Special uh, Planning and Land Use Management Act and the Communal Land Tenure Bill, which will soon be released for public comment before it is introduced to the South. The administration of the Special Planning and Land Use Management Act has been transferred to the presidency. Secondly, sustainable land reform, that is agrarian transformation. The rural economy transformation model, which provides a development framework in this, in this regard, and the, and the strategic farmer support services program. Thirdly, improved food security, that's agricultural policy action plan and the strengthening of relative rights of people working the land. Sitting here, seated here amongst the audience there, we, in the audience there are some of South Africa's 50-50 uh, pioneers in terms of sharing, uh, uh, the, or, or in terms of promoting inclusive agricultural uh, development in our country. <laughs> Fourthly, smallholder farmer development and support. Fifthly, increase access to quality basic infrastructure and services, particularly in education, healthcare, and public transport in rural areas. In this regard, uh, we have the, the, the ETC, the Economic Transformation Committee of the, of the, of the, of the Governing Party, as, uh, as presented to the National Executive Committee of the ANC and adopted a program turning South Africa into a construction site focusing on townships and rural areas. This program we've put together a, a technical team uh, from the DBSA, TCTA, and IDC to come up with a, a workable plan. But the cutting edge to this program is going to be the agri-parks. And in, in, in I, I'm made to believe that there is a document that uh, is based on the plans that have been developed reflecting this, what I'm talking about, on Moritele in, in the Northwest. Number, <laughs> number five, increased access to quality basic infrastructure and services, particularly education, healthcare, and, um, and, and, and public transport in rural areas. This is going to cover that, because the agri-parks, and, uh, and, uh, and in, the, in the audience there, there are a number of, of mayors from district municipalities, the agri-parks are going to be a comprehensive uh, program of development because we can no longer continue. Of course, here in the Western Cape, you go to Wittenberg in the Western Cape here so that members of the, of the, of the, of the Democratic Party sitting here, when they, they disbelieve what I'm saying, I'm going to say to them, you don't believe what you're doing yourself here under our leadership here in Wittenberg. It's a beautiful story there, Wittenberg. So, so, and there are many. Yeah, there are many. Here is a beautiful booklet. It will show you what we're doing across the country in this regard and others. Number six, growth of sustainable rural enterprises and industries characterized by strong rural urban lineages, increased investment in agro-processing, trade development, and access to markets and financial services res resulting in rural jobs. Here again, the National Development Plan turning South Africa into a construction site with district agri-parks and farmer production support units, which are a reality in a number of municipality now, municipalities now in the country. The key agrarian transmission measurables are the following in this regard. One, meeting basic human needs, refer, reference re reconstruction development program. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the RTP. Secondly, proliferation of agro-village enterprises and industries, including agro-manufacturers and, and retailers, sustained by credit facilities, markets, and other strategic logistics. And finally, improved land tenure system. Challenges and mitigation. We have many challenges. We acknowledge this. We don't hide that. We have many challenges. But we take heart in the following quotation from Che Guevara. The road is long and full of difficulties. At times, we wander from the path and must turn back. At other times, we go too fast and separate ourselves from the masses of our people. On occasions, we go too slow and feel the hot breath of those treading on our heels. In our zeal as revolutionists, we try to move ahead as fast as possible, clearing the way, but knowing 
we must draw our sustenance from the mass and that it can advance more rapidly only if we inspire it by our own example. That is, that is fundamental, so fundamental in fact that it informed uh, uh, the 53rd National Conference of the, of the ANC uh, uh, when it ushered in what it called second phase transition of the National Democratic Revolution characterized by radical economic transformation. Economic transformation, however, is not for itself, but for changing the social conditions of our people for the better. That's a measure, that's a measure of radical economic transformation. In that context, therefore, radical socioeconomic transformation is more appropriate, which is defined as follows. That is a fundamental change in the structure, systems, institutions, and patterns of ownership, management, and control of the economy. Contrary to the prevalent public narrative, this is a succinct and, 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 and actionable definition. What it requires is political will to drive it. All of us, all of us. Our biggest challenge remains the answer to the question though, who owns South Africa? In terms of phase one of our land audit, it became clear that we still needed to conduct an audit in terms of, of land ownership by race, gender and nationality. We have just concluded the latter process. That is, that is now phase two. However, there are still huge challenges because of gaps as a result of the absence of information in respect of institutions, such as trusts, private and public organizations and companies, as well as sectional title holdings. The source of this enduring challenge is incoherent institutional transformation both in, within and external to the Department of Rural Development Land Reform. For example, the two examples, the absence of a dynamic interactive relationship between the National Geometrics Management Services, the surveys, and the DIS registration system, yet the former fits into the latter. There's that incoherence there which we're dealing with as term, in terms of us making sure that the information that we, we take out to the public with regards to phase two of the land audit is accurate. Secondly, we have proje projectized the land claims process. Now, if you, if you really look at it, it's five years. We say people come and lodge claims over a, and you give them a, a period of five years. This, in our view, and, and we're canvassing this, we've canvassed this with the governing party and we've agreed that indeed we need to have a look at this because this was a strategic error which did not take into account fiscal constraints, complexities associated with verification and valid, or val or validation of, of claims, court challenges and internal capacity constraints. In terms of moving forward, we are working on transforming the Land Claims Commission into a Chapter 9 institution so that people, uh, because land was taken from people over, over centuries, a lot of the people from whom land was, dis was taken through wars of dispossession are no longer there. We need research because there are so many embedded land claims. And some of the embedded land claims are claims that relate to traditional areas where you have traditional leadership. The leadership, the, the executive of the House of Traditional Leaders in Limpopo advised me, they said to me, when you look at, when you, when you process claims that have got traditional institutions involved, be careful, follow the then TAPO Commission, and the, of course it has been now uh, uh, decentralized to provinces. They say follow this carefully because some of the traditional leaders today were imposed by colonialists and apartheid uh, and the apartheid regime. You might, uh, we might give land to what you believe is a, tra is, is a legitimate traditional leader or institution, it is not, it may not be. After the Intlapo Commission result, then you might actually find out that you did without uh, uh, intention a wrong thing by giving land to the wrong uh, uh, chief. So they said, be careful as you do that. So a lot of these embedded claims, so we want to give enough time, let it be in other countries like Australia. They don't have a project, that's why five years. It's a, it's a lifelong thing because research will show all the time 
that people, in fact, as you can see during the second window. During the second window, we consulted no less than 1,296 people who had received land. And they said, they said to us, Minister, please go back and ask government to reopen the land claims. Because a lot of the people with whom we were removed uh, uh, together from this, from this land are no longer, are not there because they, they don't enjoy it because they didn't claim for whatever reason. Now we can't bring them in because in terms of law, they must apply, they must lodge claims and be processed, etc. They say, please reopen so that these people can have an opportunity to join us so that together we can enjoy this land which has been brought back to us. So that is the essence, that is, that is essentially what drove us to go to the cabinet and request that we open the land claims. So that is why now we're talking about turning, change, transforming this land claims commission into a chapter nine institution so that our people can have the opportunity over the long term to, to look at themselves uh, in, in direct with, with family and friends and people they were removed with, they can lodge claims over the, over the, on an ongoing basis rather than as a project here. In terms of moving forward, we're working on transforming the Land Claims Commission therefore into a chapter nine institution. The National Geomatics Management Service, these registries and Office of the Valor General will be listed as scheduled two ent uh, entities in terms of the Public Finance Management Act of 1999. This is important because a lot of people particularly, if you look at the, uh, at the, of, of the Office of the Valor General, a lot of people, including farmers, in particular farmers, they, they're very, very sensitive about this question and say, this office ought to be independent so that we can trust it. And they keep writing to the, to the Velo General. Now there is a, there's a regulation, a set of regulations that, we, that we've sent out for public comment. A lot of, uh, some of them are even threatening, threatening to take him to court because they believe that he, is, he can't be independent because he's attached to the department, etc. But this is a process. We're moving in that direction. By the way, the Velo General is sitting here because we keep on talking about willing buy, willing sell. There's no such a thing. I've been saying this so many times. There is no willing buyer, willing seller in the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. There is no willing buyer, willing seller in the policies of the governing party, the African National Congress. The ANC conference took a resolution. It said, establish the office of the Valor General. We are, actually, we are one of a few in the world, not just in South Africa. It's the first time ever in the country. There's the man. Please. Uh, Chris, stand up so that people see you as, there's he. That's the Valor General, the first ever in the country. It's one of a few in the world. Namibia has got one recently. We ha we're trying to link up with others. We get some in Australia, etc. So we have it. And that is the office that has the, the final say in terms of the requirements, uh, in terms of a just and equitable principle in the constitution of our country. He's working very closely with the University of Cape Town. You remember me saying that, but now the Vets, Vets University has also joined in. They're working together. So that they're training, they're doing in-service training uh, to, to the valuers that are, present, that, are, that are present in the country. Because our universities also, I'm talking institutional transformation now, in terms of the, of the, of the, of the radical socioeconomic transformation there. There's institutions there. Our institutions of learning have not adjusted their own curricula to fall in line with the, with the constitution of a country. They're still focusing in training on, on, on market value and ignore the four other aspects or factors in the constitution of the republic. So he's driving that relationship with the investors, thanks to the investor of Cape Town and Vets University for now. A further challenge relates to water rights being allocated to individuals, not to, to the land. This is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful initiative now with the Minister of Water and Sanitation. She actually is, is going to, trans to, 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 to change this so that water rights are attached to land, not to individuals. When an individual sells the land, therefore, the individual lives, the, 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 lives with the water rights. This is a serious matter. They live with water rights. And, and in some instances, you know what's happening, the BEE culture is setting in in this regard. In some instances, when, when, when people, when, when commercial farmers now who are white, they enter into an arrangement with black people who want to be part, partner them in the, in the business. 
They say, okay, no problem. Bring water rights. Do, do you hear that? Just bring water rights. And they come with water rights and they become partners. But every other thing remains in the hands of the commercial farmer. That's a problem. Furthermore, subdivisions and changes of land use are happening at a rapid pace. An audit needs to be conducted in respect of both these issues because they negatively impact on land reform farms. Although regulated by laws, compliance with the enforcement of such legislation needs to be strengthened. A lot is happening in these functions with minimal accountability. We're talking about institutional transformation in the context of the radical socio-economic transformation. The second institutional challenge is that unless an owner expresses a need to change and submit information voluntarily, our current legal system is unable to compel a, a production of that information. They deliberately withhold information about the changes on land and or property. At present, we have no institutional mechanism to enforce disclosure. Cabinet is considering the report of phase two of land audit and we are expecting strong decisions to address all these institutional ch challenges. And the land commission provided for in the regulation of agricultural land bill will enforce disclosure of ownership of land and landed property. It's just a small onion thing here. <laughs> a small thing here. We've got the regulation, we call it the regulation of agricultural land holdings bill. Now, here is a catch. Again, and because of the radical socioeconomic transformation, we check this. There is a law of 1926 that defines agricultural small holding, rather, agricultural land holding, rather, only confined to one province, the Transvaal. In a, in a sense here, yeah, we would have fallen into a trap of saying agricultural land holdings bill, as we have been saying now. We are changing that. It is going to be agricultural land bill, not land holding. By the time it comes here, it will not be land holding. Because if it is land holding without us knowing, it will have referred only to the transfer. That's institutional transformation. When we talk about radical socio-economic transformation, we talk real issues like this one. So we have found it with, through the, 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 the process of looking into the land audit phase two. Who owns this country? Finally, budget allocation. Um, Honorable Chair, we have a budget here of 10, of 10 billion rands here. This is a budget which we are presenting to, to this August for the, our National Assembly. And uh, we hope that uh, the House will, 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 will approve it so that we can carry on with the agenda we've just described. In conclusion, by 2030, South Africa should experience more integrated, vibrant, equitable, and sustainable rural urban com communities that are supported by requisite logistics, social and economic infrastructure, inclusive economies, development finance institutions, and credit facilities. Bustling mar markets, small, micro, medium, and large-scale enterprises and industries, employing millions of people, and supported by research, innovation, and information and technology centers. This is the National Development Plan. I'm talking to the National Development Plan, and all that I've been talking to now is the National Development Plan. Now, this is exactly the point. No, the, the, the honorable member is correct. The, con the honorable member is correct. That is exactly, that is exactly, that is exactly what we are, we are talking about here. This, this honorable chair, this policy speech is not talking about mythical things out there. It's talking about issues that are happening. Check here. You've got, it's, yeah, it's going to come. It's going to be distributed to everybody. This is an exhibition of what we are doing in terms of rural development and land reform in the country. Now we have appointed, some of the mayors are sitting there, all the district mayors, including your district mayors, honorable members here, all of them to be political champions of the agri-parks. That is why we are going to visit Wetzenberg here to see that one, because I've been invited there. I'm going to go there. 
So sitting there. I will go to Wittenberg and see them. One day you come with me and see what we're doing. So that when you say sitting here as one of the members in the opposition, no, no, nothing is happening, that's a joke. We say to you, is this a joke? It's here. Wittenberg. Wittenberg is one of our best examples of product, of project, of, 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 uh, of, of development. It's, it's not the only one. Look at Beaufort West, Beaufort West. Again, Beaufort West here in the Western Cape, Honorable Chair. We've got the most advanced youth integrated development center in the country. It's Beaufort West. Right under the noses of the honorable members of the opposition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. The next speaker is the Honorable Nguenya Mbila. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Let me indicate that as the ANC, we support budget vote 39. The late Honorable Nelson Mandela once said, I quote, a fair land redistribution to its former black owners will guarantee peace, stability, and national reconciliation as the country emerged from the white minority rule, close quote. Furthermore, Section 25 of the Constitution, Subsection 5, indicates that the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to foster conditions which enable citizens to gain access to land on equitable basis. Therefore, land must be given back to the rightful owners following the existing legislative frameworks. If those frameworks does not address the issue of land question, it is our responsibility as this House to review those legislative frameworks. Let's therefore not encourage land grabs. We know that success is a journey, not a project. The budget for the commission has increased from 3.1 billion in 1617 to 3.25 billion in 1718 and 10.3 billion for the MTEF thereof. The commission on restitution has been able to spend its allocated budget for three consecutive years which is the indication that the commission has got the capacity to spend, and it's, it's an indication that the commission dem demand is huge and resources are limited to finalize all the claims circled in each financial year. Honorable Chair, we agree that the restitution process is low. Other claims lodged by the 31st of December 1998 are not yet researched due to capacity constraints. The plan of the Commission to fast track the research of the claims lodged by the 31st of December 1998 is mostly welcomed as the research is the most important component of the lodgement process as it indicates whether the claim lodged is valid or invalid. As the committee, we will monitor whether the 916 outstanding unresearched claims are finalized by the end of, the, of this quarter in this financial year. Although we are concerned about the slow pace of some of the institutions in finalizing the research process, the contract signed with those institutions who submit poor research work must be canceled without delay, as they will further delay the restitution process. Some of the reasons, Chair, that delays the restitution process are the long term time taken to conduct the research, the conflicts among, amongst the claimants or beneficiaries, competing or overlapping claims, claims being challenged by landowners through court high land prices charged by the landowners. Therefore, let the claimants unite and speak with one voice for their claims to be processed and finalized on time. To have land is not a privilege, but it's a right. People need land to build houses, people need land to farm, people need land to do business for them to contribute to the economic growth of the country. We appreciate the efforts made by the commission to trace the the claimants who have not yet come forth for their financial compensation. The commission must continue to trace the outstanding claimants which have not come forward for their compensation to ensure that all the claimants entitled for financial compensation receive what is due to them. The restitution of land rights amendment bill which has been tabled as a private member bill will be tabled to the committee in due course. Let the citizens exercise their section 59 constitutional rights. The commission must improve communication with claimants and update them about the status of their claim. The policy on the exceptions to the 1913 cut of date to accommodate the Khoi and the Sun people, access to heritage sites and historical landmarks is taking long to be finalized. Consultations were done, let the department finalize this policy to ensure that the Khoi and the Sun benefit from the land reform program. 
people will not be free until their land is returned to them. The reduction of the compensation of employees budget by 3% will have a negative impact in the operation of the commission, as the commission will not be able to fill critical vacant positions. Therefore, the department must engage treasury on this matter as the land issue is a priority. Therefore, resources allocation must be aligned to that. Currently, the position of the deputy chief land commissioner is vacant. The department must ensure that this post is filled by the end of the second quarter. The compensation of the employees' budget for the department has decreased, which is a concern, but the committee is also concerned about the high number of experienced officials who are leaving the department as this has a negative impact in service delivery. The transfer of the recap from the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform to DAF is welcome to avoid the duplication of the post settlement support given to farmers. The department must fund the last tranche of the outstanding recap beneficiaries in this financial year. Due to the high rate of unemployment rate, the department initiated the NARISEC program to capacitate the youth. It was a good program, but after the completion of the training, long time is being taken to issue the certificates by CITAS to participants, which diminishes the intention of this program and demotivates the NARISEC participants. We therefore requested the Department of Rural Development and the Department of Higher Education to intervene on this matter to ensure that the, certif the certificates are issued on time. There is therefore a need for the reviewal of this uh, program, which is a NARISEC program. The department has initiated a lot of projects to fight poverty, unemployment, and inequality. Projects such as 50-50, one household, one hectare, one household, two dairy cows, but the department is expected to table the policies to the committee that guides them in the implementation of these projects. The department has planned to table some legislations in this financial year, let the bills be tabled on time for them to be processed accordingly. No bill will be fast-tracked. The failure of the department to submit policies and legislation on time must be addressed. We commend the department for tabling the CPA and the ESTA amendment bills. Honorable Chair, the public hearings were held by the committee on ESTA amendment bill, which is aimed at improving the tenure security to farm dwellers and farm workers. Honorable Chair, farm dwellers are still evicted without following proper procedures by farm owners. Farm dwellers are, are being assaulted. There are cases reported, but no action is being taken. Their livestock being taken. They are being deprived their rights to stay with their children. Lack of immediate access to anti-eviction toll-free number. They are not being allowed to be visited. They are being deprived the basic services. Others are not being assisted by the land rights management facility. The ESTA amendment bill will address some of the challenges faced by the farm dwellers and the farm workers. Let the land rights management facility support the victims until the case reported is finalized. Let SAPS be trained on its role in the implementation of ESTA. The department to try and enter into partnership with legal institutions to strengthen the legal representation of the farm dwellers and the farm workers. That the toll-free number be accessible when farm dwellers and workers use their cell phones. Actions be taken against those who disregard the court judgments, especially the farm owners. The Office of the Auditor General exists to strengthen the country democracy by enabling oversight, accountability, and governance in the public sector through auditing by building public confidence. Therefore, the recommendations of the AG must be taken seriously. We appreciate the efforts of the department in developing a plan to address the gaps identified in the audit report to avoid the recurring audit findings and ensure compliance. It is also the responsibility of the accounting officer to ensure effective and efficient monitoring review system to ensure that the departmental goals and objectives as set out in the strategic annual performance and operational plans are achieved and to implement the corrective actions in cases of underperformance. The department has been able to fill vacancies with competent staff. That is why there is improvement in its performance as compared to the previous years. The quality of of performance report of the department has improved over the last three years. There is a slight improvement in compliance with legislations. More still needs to be done. The departmental budget was 9.4 billion in 2014-15, 9.3 billion in 2015-16, 10.1 billion in 16-17, and 10.184 in 17-18. The department has been able to spend its allocated budget but more needs to be done to ensure that the spending is aligned to its performance. To fight corruption and maladministration, the minister in his 2016 and 17 budget vote indicated that a panel of lawyers to conduct pre-disciplinary investigations have been appointed 
and actions will be taken against those implicated. Honorable Minister, there's a lot of outcry about the alleged corruption in the department, especially in the restitution and plus farms. People who want farms for listing and are unable to access them. Some of the officials want bribe, logistic visa city in Jonjo. Others allocate farms to friends and relatives. Let the audit be done on the plus farms to understand who is occupying the farm. Where and how that person has accessed the farm. Is there any lease agreement that has been signed and how much is being paid for lease rentals? Lots of investigations were done, but sometimes actions take long to be implemented. At the beginning of the term, the department and the entities are expected to table the strategic plan, further that in each financial year, they must present annual performance plan together with operational plans. That plan will enable the committee to do its oversight effectively. We therefore commend the ITP for ensuring that the two plans are presented. As the committee were concerned about the delay by ITP in finalizing policies, the ITP has to finalize the policies of funding cultural events and bursary policy and other outstanding policies to ensure that funding allocation is done in, is done in order, not haphazardly. The ITP is commended for being able to pay service providers on time who submitted undisputed invoices, as said by the Honorable President in the SONA that service providers must be paid within 30 days. The ITP is expected to use its allocated resources effectively, efficiently, and economically for the benefit of the rural people living in the ITP land area. The provision of the financial support to youth living in the ITP land is mostly welcome and appreciated. It will decrease the number of unskilled youth and create job opportunities for young people. The community development plan of the ITP must be aligned to municipal ITPs and to ensure that there's good relationship between ITP, local municipalities, and other government departments to avoid siloed de development and promote comprehensive integrated development. The Department of Rural Development and Land Reform must play its role in guiding and monitoring the implementation of the ITP Act. ITP reports must be submitted to the department first before being tabled to parliament. That is a must. No report will be considered by the committee if not tabled to parliament by the minister. We appreciate that the ITP has been able to appoint contract workers permanently, but more still needs to be done to ensure that people with disability are recruited as per the white paper on the rights of the people with disabilities as adopted by cabinet in 2015. Reduction of using consultants must be considered. Instead, job opportunities must be created to fight poverty and to address high rate of unemployment in rural areas. <laughs> Honorable Chair, as the committee, we will intensify our oversight responsibilities to ensure that no fruitless, wasteful, irregular expenditure will be tolerated. And to those who are responsible, they must Honorable account. Member, Any detection of the necessary action must be taken. Chairperson, thank you very much. Thank you. Next week is the Honorable Robertson. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to everybody here. Uh, Honorable Minister, I'm glad that you mentioned the Survey Generals here today, but the person we really want, uh, the Valuer Generals here today, the person we really want to speak to is the Survey General. Is he here today? He's the person we want to speak to about land. Today, I beg your pardon. Today, I paint a picture to millions of disadvantaged South Africans who look at land as the only remaining answer to addressing long-term indignities and economic isolation. The hardest reality is for people to embrace is the realization that this governing party will not succeed in, ad in addressing land reform issues despite having the necessary legislation in place to do it. Some Tlomo Trust in Mpumalanga is restituted land with ongoing business concerns, but the beneficiaries have not received one cent. They also have not received title deeds, and they have no say with regarding the finances of their own property. Can you imagine the feeling of utter frustration? In the Eastern Cape, near Tsitsikama, was a thriving commercial hydroponic tomato farm called Cornucopia that has now completely collapsed. The farm was purchased for a workers' trust consisting of employees of that farm. Now, the farm stands desolate. The 18 tunnels that were provided for the hydroponics stands weather beaten and empty. We cannot point fingers at the beneficiaries though, because government involvement and mentorship required to assist the emerging farmers was non-existent 
and the Lapumalanga Development Trust was set on the inevitable course of failure. It is these blunders that are currently causing disadvantage to the disadvantaged. Honorable Chair, had we addressed mentorship for shortfalls on land reform and given the beneficiaries ownership of their land through unconditional title deeds, emerging farmers or beneficiaries would be so much closer to participating in the economy. I will ask this question. If state mentorship is stagnant and non-effective, and those that have the, acknowledge and ex uh, the knowledge and experience on farming are publicly ostracized constantly, who exactly is going to mentor emerging farmers and beneficiaries of land reform? What the DA will do is allocate additional funding to the purposes of research and development that will fast track and the finalization of claims. We will ensure that the policy is implemented effectively. We will increase the budget for mentorship programs so as to drastically improve the chances of success for emerging farmers. We will approach existing stakeholders to assist and offer business models that speak to the development of disadvantaged South Africans. Finally, the DA are the only party that truly wants the poor to own their own property, and that dependency on the state should be transformed into prosperous participation of the poor in our economy. I thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honourable Matease. I'll share, if according to the Bible, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is a mystery of greater understanding. Then the rise passage ceremony to genuine economic freedom and sovereignty can be found in a Marxian philosophy, where Marx and Engels write, I quote, the ability of man to free himself from superstition and fear is the beginning of wisdom and becomes capable of forging and fighting for his own material happiness. And that is the beginning of revolutionary consciousness. Honorable Chairperson, this year marks 104, 104 years since a white minority regime passed the Native Land Act 1930. The act has many other before and after 1930, legislated away the humanity of black people by confining them to just 7% of the land of this country. This year also marks 144 years since the murder of in Robben in Robin Island of Nkosi Makoma Kangik who led three of the nine wars of the resistance against colonial land dispossession in what is now known as the Eastern Cape. Defined by colonialists as a savage of extraordinary ability and a commander of savage second none. It remains to us an immortal inspiration to all dispossessed people across this country and this continent. Today, the descendants, the descendants of the colonialists who murdered him are with us in this house, John, denying that they are beneficiaries of a brutal system which stripped black people of their humanity. Today, we have a government led by black people which refuses to complete the struggle that their great grandfathers died for. Most of these people who lead us are descendants of those warrior men and women led by Makoma, Bambata, Mushweshe, Mampuru, Shaka, and many other gallant fighters of our people who died with their spear held high in defense of our land and their humanity. Today, 144 years after Makoma took his last breath, black people are still landless, black people are still nationless, black people are still pariahs in the land of their own birth. Today, 23 years after the ANC took over power and forced through a land policy premised on a ridiculous principle of William Bayer, William Seller, only 8% of land in South Africa has been transferred back to black people since the end of apartheid colonialism. Raiposa, Lilowe Kimang. Today, 23 years after blacks were given political power and after credible opinion, after credible opinion, showing that property clauses in the constitution is a major hindrance to land reform, the ANC refuses to amend the constitution to allow for speedy land reform. Sias Buza, Kuti, Today, African people stand on the same grounds Sol Plaki stood on 1913 when he said, I quote, the South African native found himself not actually a slave, but a pariah in the land of his birth, close quote. Today, a black person in this country has not advanced from where his forebearers stood 
has not acquired any changed socioeconomic position. He is not less a pariah, but a bastardized modern wage slave. V had for Jalaba Tuver. As a result of this, we as a country have no land reform program, but a massive land purchase program and endless excuses from the ANC. That is why out of a budget of 10.1 billion for this financial year, 3.2 billion will go to component dealing with restitution, which entails, amongst other things, buying up land from white farmers to be returned back to black people. Who bewitched you, we ask. At the rate at which we are going, it will take us more than 120 years to transfer at least 40% of the land back to black people. This is a crisis. It needs resolute leadership. The ANC has been sloganeering for far too long, talking about radical economic transformation on one hand, while, while wanting to appease white feelings on the other. Once again, we offer our support to you to amend the Constitution. This may be the very last chance you have to do something meaningful for our people. You will lose vote in 2019, and you will be in no position to lead a program of radical change in our society. Again, you will lament that you have been wished. Then you will, be, you will only be remembered as people who had no balls to dismantle the key fund foundations of white supremacy and black subjugation in this country. Minister, we must also tell you right now, your attempts to recreate the Bantu Authorities Act through your communal land bill is a very dangerous attempt at circumventing democracy in rural areas. Ubani Ukutakatile, Minister. We need to deal with the continuing bantification in the former homelands in a, in a manner that respects the rights of all people, including unmarried and widowed women, gay and lesbian people to own land. Your assertion that in areas where there are both communal property associations and traditional authorities, your department will recognize only traditional authorities is ridiculous and must be condemned. Honorable Under Member, these circumstances, your time is we can only remind expired. all and sundry the PAC struggle songs. Honorable Member, we want to remind your you time this has risk, expired. The economic freedom fighters reject this budget vote. Thank you so much. The next speaker is the Honorable Schlengwa. Honorable House Chairperson, Honorable Minister, and the two Deputy Ministers in the Department, Honorable Members. At the outset, I just want to say, Honorable Chair, that whilst the land question is a very emotional and an emotive one, we must deal with it with the necessary maturity and sobriety which it deserves, because it has the potential, if recklessly handled, to take this country backwards. Having said that, it does not mean we must be complacent and not move with the necessary speed to actually deal with the land question. Expropriation with compensation remains the IFP policy. And by compensation, we do not mean that it must be profit-seeking. So the first order of business that we'd like to charge the minister and the department to look at, and I'm glad that the Evaluar General is here as it be, has been introduced, that quite a number of land claims have taken place and exorbitant amounts of money have been paid. We charge the department to go back and investigate the collusion and the criminal element that took place in those transactions. There are instances whereby land which ordinarily should have cost five million rands People took it for 15 million rands, and we and lifestyle audit must take place of the officials involved so that we can actually begin to recover the money that was lost unnecessarily because we cannot abuse, you know, this important responsibility of giving land to our people and, by, and abuse it with officials, lawyers, and persons who are criminals. So we charge you, Minister, that investigate this thing. It's in the national interest because it will legitimize what you are doing. For so long as there's a criminal element, then we can't take it seriously as a genuine endeavor um, of the government. Honorable House Chairperson, <coughs> if there was development taking place in rural areas, and I come from the rural south coast of Guazul, Natal, but for everything, I need to go to town. And that being the phenomenon, 
It means that we are overburdening urban areas with the slow pace of development in rural areas. Healthcare, housing, infrastructure, water, sanitation, the whole nine yards, urban areas find themselves burdened. And so <clears throat> we've got a wall-to-wall -wall municipal system in this country in any case. We must begin ensuring that municipalities which are in rural communities in the main are given the necessary capacity, skills, knowledge, and expertise to be economically viable so that we do not have this continuous exodus of people from urban, rural areas to urban, urban areas. With that, of course, we're not saying people must not move to urban areas, but let us begin creating new economies in rural areas. I mean, the, the concept of special economic zones can work if our minds are duly applied to it. Umzumbe on the south coast of KwaZulu Natal for a long time um, was the hive of um, um, beans production. Today, that is no longer happening, and people have to pay 110 rands for five kgs of beans. So really, this is in the national interest that we go back and zoom into the capabilities of rural areas and begin constructing de the development agenda around the strengths and capabilities um, of, of, of those communities. Find Honorable Chairperson, I just want to say, Minister, we need to have Narisek revived and working better um, th than we've seen before. Allow me, Honorable House Chairperson, to say, if we want to address the land question properly, the genesis should be going back to the departure your the time is now expired. If we are to legitimately address the land question, I thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is the Honorable Kubisa. Salo, Sloni Shwangongoshe, Nongongoshe, Abaparatwetu, Nama Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members. I say Shoguti, si yaimuge na i budget Nongongoshe. Godu age, which we feel are they are very pertinent. And we want to agree that we really need an audit of the land because, quite frankly, we'll find that 70% of our land that was dispossessed from us is in the hands of a few. And that phenomenon needs to be redressed. That has to be attended. Hence, there is a need for an an, an audit minister, and it's, it's very urgent. And again, we understand that uh, our, our kings possessed land, our people had land even before 1913. Now, if the act says, let's deal with uh, communities who were, were dispossessed of their land after 1913, I think that is not fair because our people possessed land in the ages. And that has to be taken into cognizance as well. And of course, we understand that land brings dignity to our people. And our people need title deeds. And once they possess title deeds, they feel that they are the owners of land. And it is their land. And we must ensure that they get this land. We understand uh, from the side of the department that uh, this department has a role in growing rural economy through agri-parks accelerating land reform, recapitalizing, and redeveloping redistribution of, far of farms, creating opportunities for rural youth. But uh, Minister, I must also say that there are a lot of bottlenecks, and I, I, you have alluded to this yourself, that uh, we need to deal with the land claims that go as far as 1998. And of course, we see that there's some a slow pace and there is also corruption that other honorable members have referred to. That, those are the issues that need to be attended to uh, in, when we are dealing with this issue of land. Those bottlenecks that cause a slow pace for people to have land have to be attended to. I know that your department minister has to work in tandem with other departments like uh, cocktail, like also agriculture and fisheries. Let us deal with this issue of uh, farmers who are abusing our, 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 the, way, the, way the farm workers. But, uh, then, but also at the same time, farmers must not be killed because there are so many incidents of farmers that are killed all over the country. That issue must be attended to. 
Because whilst we deal with those farmers that are abusing our people, let us also deal with those who kill the farmers because we don't want that kind of anarchy in our country. And of course, the issue of land is a very sensitive one as we deal with it. And of course, we don't need any anarchy. It must be dealt with within the ambit of the legislation. And Minister, I want to say uh, it is very important also that to show that those who get farms are given these mentorship skills, uh, expert knowledge, so that they're able to farm them. Because we see that these farms are lying in waste because these people don't have uh, uh, some skills to farm. They need the training. Our youth need training, enter into cooperatives so that they are able to, to use this land. And it will also help those in the rural areas uh, to be in the, the, those places. And we prevent this whole thing of urbanization and we see the mushrooming of, of, of uh, sheds because our people are leaving the rural areas to, to the urban areas. I think these are pivotal issues that have got to Honourable be attended member, to. Your time is Minister, expired. thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is the Honorable Deputy Minister of Rural Development and Land Reform, the Honorable Squatcher. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister Nkwinti, Honorable Deputy Minister, members of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Members, Acting DG and your team, all Honorable Members gathered here today, good morning. Let me start rather in an odd way and learn and take from a leaf of one of my colleagues from the opposition parties who stood on this platform two days ago and indicated, as I indicate now, that as we speak today, women and children in South Africa are being killed. I'm just raising this to say, let all men stand up and say, not in our name. I want to thank the minister for his stewardship in guiding us as we implement the policies of our government in relation to matters of land reform and rural development. His calm and measured approach keeps us in check as we lead these developmental issues. Discussions on land are often emotive and consequently, it can sometimes be easy not to think straight. When one is in such a state of mind, it could be easy to submit to populist rhetoric and abandon your own program. Honorable members, it's appropriate that we might remind ourselves about where we come from. So I thought I should share with you what one Alfred Honley, a liberal European with German lineage said in 1939 commenting on the native reserves set aside for the indigenous who had been dispossessed, I quote, Europeans can own land in the reserves and reside on it. On the other hand, no native individual or tribe may own land in an area set aside for white ownership, close quotes. It is precisely because of condescending views such as these that during the budget debate last year, I said, and I quote again, after our victory 22 years ago, we began to right the wrongs, to bring justice to our divided land. We have not done to those who robbed us of our land what they did to us. Instead, in the moment of our victory, we acknowledged their rights as well, close quotes. In fact, our great leader, Oliver Tambo, put this very clear addressing the World Council of Churches in 1980 when he said, what was arrogantly described as a civilizing mission in South Africa was in fact the genocidal destruction of the Khoi and the Sen people. The land expropriation of the rest of the indigenous people, the obliteration of their culture in all its forms, the application of a consistent policy for the impoverishment of the black people and their transformation into labor units for the enrichment of the colonizer, quote unquote. 
So ladies and gentlemen, we should not be tempted to stray from our chosen path of implementing the National Development Plan by revolutionary sounding propositions that look attractive in their appearance, but whose content could cause our country more harm than good. Ideas that could reverse the gains achieved thus far towards the building of a democratic, non-racial, non-sensual South Africa. Reversing the effects of colonial conquest will take some time. We just need to sharpen our policies, strategies, and tools. So say, it might be a matter of who is bewitched between the rational people of South Africa and the EFF. Before I get to the detailed presentation on the budget, I would like to reiterate once again, referring to last year's debate, we okay. said as a department we are implementing. Honorable Deputy Minister, will you just take a seat, please? Why are you rising, Honorable Member? Can the Deputy Minister take, uh, take a question? Honorable Deputy Minister, are you prepared to take a question from the Honorable Member? Very, very, very much so, sir, after I've completed my speech. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Deputy Minister will take a question if there's time left after his speech. Thank you. Continue, Honorable Deputy Minister. DLRCs in all 44 districts which should deal with all applications. These DLRCs mean that power has now been devolved from the national office to stakeholders involved in agriculture and farming. We have a wonderful program of one household, one hectare. The department initiated this program called One Hectare, One Household in 2015, targeting state-owned farms, plus farms, and communal land with the purpose of creating rural smallholder producers at household level to ensure food security. Currently, the department has granted approval for 158 sites, benefiting 5,734 households across the country. We also have the strengthening of the relative rights of the people working the land. The overall progress regarding this program includes the receipt of more than 100 proposals, of which 14 were approved as at the end of the 2016-2017 financial year. To date, we have invested an amount of 680 million, benefiting 4,450 beneficiaries. The following represent some of the 14 approved projects. In the Eastern Cape, Beberry Farm, Free State, Outlands, and in many, many other areas in our, in our country. <clears throat> Honorable Chair, oh, sorry. On restitution, the Commission has actually exceeded most of its annual performance targets during the financial year 2016-2017. The Commission has settled 804 land claims and finalized 672. It is exciting to know that the Commission, which is on the cusp of autonomy, has achieved a clean audit in its financial management. Some of our restitution projects have attained international stature where their produce competes amongst the best in the world. The Ravelle restitution projects in Limpopo churns out 10 million annual turnover with monotonous regularity, while the re while the Nganini restitution project in KZN is training unemployed youth with metric qualification in sugarcane production. Despite our successes, we are aware that there are some communities whose claims were submitted before the 1998 cut-off date, which have not been resolved yet. We are coming and we are dealing with that. Tomorrow, we will be in the area of Lavai Camp in George at a ceremony that marks the final stage in the settlement of a claim there. I'm also delighted to have in the gallery 87-year-old Mr. Pagami Samdala from Kwakima. It's difficult. I can't ask an old man to stand up. Maybe he can wave if he wishes to. But he is one of those people who lost the claim in 1998. In the financial year 2017-2018, the department will invest an amount of 112 million in the acquisition of land for farm dwellers and labor tenants in order to entrench their security of tenure. The department has also established labor tenants 
farm, farm dweller forums at national, provincial, and districts on communal property institutions. The introduction of a land reform program created the possibility for communities and larger groups of persons to control land on a communal basis. This necessitated the passing of the CPA Act of 1996. There are currently 1,513 CPAs that have been registered countrywide. The enormous resources that are normally at the disposal of these entities tend to manufacture conflict that eventually renders the entities dysfunctional. The CPA Act is currently being amended with a view to strengthen control mechanisms and establish a proper register of CPAs. As indicated by the minister, we have a valor general which has been introduced. His work is definitely a work that has to be appreciated because it also helps in saving money for government. In conclusion, let me conclude by recapping what is it that we're attempting to do. We are about addressing the injustices of forced removals and the historical denials of access by redistributing land and through restitution. We are about ensuring security of tenure for rural people, farm dwellers, and tranca communities. We are about rekindling the emergence of the black farmer who must play a meaningful role in agro-processing value chain. We are about dealing with the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. We are doing this work without disrupting agricultural production and food security. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. This is not the next can speaker. No, there's no time for you to do that, Honorable Deputy Minister. You can do that outside the chamber. The next speaker is the Honorable Fultani. Uh, the UDM supports the budget vote, if only to help the poor citizens of South Africa. We note that notwithstanding our suggestion we made earlier, which we made during the discussions in the Portfolio Committee with regard to making agri-parks more productive and effective, till today, the Department has so far failed to produce the socio-economic impact of this program, in particular in the districts where this program is already in operation. Poor decision-making at leadership level within the department has led to the suspension of not only the director general as of the 8th of December in 2016, but also a number of other senior administrative heads in some provinces in the country. Naturally, this hampers progress in the rollout of departmental programs. The UDM appeals to the minister to try to speed up the process of finalizing these outstanding disciplinary processes. As a consequence of a consistent failure by the department to bring the required and necessary bills to parliament, the department lacks the requisite legislative mandate and capacity to enable it to unapologetically effect consistent and sustainable delivery on the basis of its constitutional mandate. This unfortunate situation has dire consequences for the transformation agenda, which is geared to fundamentally change the lives of those who stand to benefit from the programs of the department. Parliament and the portfolio, port, portfolio Committee in particular must be ready to unwarrantedly shock absorb the consequences of the failure of the department when it comes, when the time to consult with the people of this bill visits us. We'll have a cramped up pro program. Logic dictates that in the absence of a legal framework to act on, there can be no space for operational policies and effectively no hope for effective government intervention. Once more, the UDM implores the department to take this weakness seriously and move to do the right thing. With urbanization fast occurring in our communities, the department may soon find itself irrelevant to the people of South Africa because a lot of people are moving to the urban areas. Do the right thing whilst you still have space. The officials of this department have very limited project management skills, and this hampers the programs of the department. Uh, at this time of the year, at this time of our program, as the country, 
It is the worst time for the department's budget to be so drastically reduced that it limits operations in the following programs. That is rural development, restitution, and redistribution. This is a collapse of the original political program. There is no foundation, therefore, for radical economic transformation. An important political question is whether the ruling party is handing over through a silver, on a silver plate all the land that was forcefully taken before 1913. The Zuma administration appears to have no appetite for this chunk of land. On top of that, over 6,000 land claims before 1998 are, have yet to be finalized. The president indicates left, whilst the caucus turns right on this Honorable member, matter. round up. CAA, is this a PICOM cool? By President Beangap, the caucus Beangap. Conclusion, the government is dithering about on this, on, on, on this um, sensitive political space. Someone else will take that space. This, the Ngonyama Trust Board continues to benefit from national focus, yet it has absolutely no operational relationship with the local sphere of government. This is a matter of concern. Lastly, Section 25 of the Constitution is not being planned to be tempered with by the Zuma administration this year. Let all the political talk not blind you. They have got no intention of doing anything. The status quo is going to remain. It's going to Honorable be the foundation member, your for time the future. Is up. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member Filtane. I will now call upon Honorable Member P.J. Grunewald. Achbare voorzitter, allemaal weer dat er gesluur wordt met grondhervorming. Dit is al amper 20 jaar na 1998 en steeds is die eisen van 98 niet afgehandeld. Nie. Ik wil die stelling maken om te zeggen dat die ANC-regering opzettelijk sluur met grondhervorming omdat hulle dit gebruik als een politieke speelbal voor politieke gewin. Dit is voor die ANC belangrijk dat hulle president moet rondgaan en vir mense sê, ons kan niet vir julle gee, want dit wat ons vir julle graag wil gee, die grond, is als gevolg van die wit mense wat die grond gesteel het en daarom moet ons nou kom met onteiening zonder vergoeding. Dit is een politieke speelbal wat baie gevaarlijk is, want eindelijk plaats die voedselzekerheid en securiteit op die spel. Want het is ons makkelijk om te zeggen dat wit mensen bezit 80% van grond in Zuid-Afrika. Is dat true, honorable minister? Sinds 2004, I'm asking for a land order. In 2015, the ANC policy documents determined that the second phase of the land audit will be available in September 2015. The second phase is very important because that second phase of the land audit would have shown the race and the gender of landowners. We are already in 2017. Why don't you disclose that? Why are you taking so long to finalize that land audit? Because it suits you. Because you can go around and say to people, we make promises to you. The moment we can sort this out, we will give you the land. Now, Honorable Minister, please give the people the land. Because at this moment, only one out of every 10 Order. transactions, the title deeds of land that was used in land reform went to the new owners. 90% of title deeds of land reform went to the government. The state owned the land. So why don't you transfer the title deeds to the new owners when it comes to land reform? No because it suits your political agenda. Let me also say, you said, Honorable Minister, that you've learned from Zimbabwe that you won't make use of land grabs. You will follow the legal path. Now, what I'm telling you, what you are busy doing is 
that you are busy with legal land grab in South Africa. If you look at the regulations published now by the Valuer General, then I'm telling you, you're going to give people about half the market value of their property. And I will for the people of South Africa say, go and look at these regulations. You don't think that this is not landbouw ground, what is sprake is not. Dit raak alle eiendom in Zuid-Afrika, want as die nieuwe onteinigingswet kom, gaan die regulaties van die waardeergeneraal ook op i eiendom van toepassing wees. Dit sluit ook onroerende eiendom in. Hierdie regulaties is die rooi vlag wat vir grondeinaar sê, word wakker en dien i beswaar in. Ek dank u. Thank you, um, Honourable Member. I will now call upon Honourable Member Matisha. Thank you. At the National Foundations Dialogue Initiative, former President uh, Mutante used an analogy in explaining the complexities and difficulties of ensuring responsible and uh, rational transformation. He referred to a poet who wrote the words, quote unquote, past, present, and future as one word. Because as the poet put it, we are always in the now. The point is that when we endeavor to address the past, it is done in the present and thus needs to be done with regard to the present, the now. Likewise, when we endeavor to put in place new plans and measures to prepare for the future, they too are done in the present. And as such, these plans and measures must be considered with a cognizance to the present, the now. And this is part in the conundrum that we face today in South Africa. When we endeavor to attend to the need to address land reform, we do so in the now, and thus must do so with cognizance to present circumstances like it is. To paraphrase an academic in poverty, land and agrarian studies, quote unquote again, popular political rhetoric on the land question, land draws on a narrow narrative in which white farmers and the foreigners are villains, black South Africans are victims, and government or the opposition party or civil society activists are heroes riding to the rescue, a political imaginary centered on the tents to dominate land discourse. However, many, or maybe the question uh, should be, how can the land question, land reform, and securing land tenure be resolved and the rural economy be reorganized so that we achieve social justice, rural development, and at the same time, feed growing numbers of urban residents at affordable prices. Mr. Minister, in our rural areas, a red flag is appearing, and that red flag is returning our country to the years of the Bantu stance or ethnicity. Government, of course, is responsible. By this, I mean the trend towards the strengthening of the role of traditional leaders in law, the buying of Amakos and uh, Indona by government, the elevation of the tribal court system, and an unwillingness by government Honourable Member, round up. security or tenor in our rural communities. One cannot help but wonder 
if instead of that, the poor and the vulnerable uh, own uh, lenders. The ANC government wants the poor to be dependent Honorable on the Honorable member, state. your time is up. Thank you, Honorable Member Madisha. I will now call upon Honorable Member Madela. Honorable House Chairperson, Minister Fuente, Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, our Director General, uh, distinguished guests, comrades, and friends. Good mornings. I wish to start out by clearly indicating that the African National Congress support this budget vote. Honorable, Honorable House Chair, I am profoundly honored and privileged to be able to participate in this budget vote today. I owe this honor and privilege to the thousands of compatriots who have made the ultimate sacrifice in the fight for our liberation from colonialism and apartheid over 342 years until we emerged from the ashes of apartheid and colonialism on the 27th of April, 1994. Yes, Honorable Minister, land dispossession has taken place over centuries. This knowledge that our freedom was not delivered on a silver platter guides me and my party, and I'm sure all of us, in our quest to advance and deepen the quest to fulfill the aspirations of our people in building a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic, and prosperous country uh, to the benefit of all our people. But more importantly, we cannot forget the legacy of injustice so that we indeed focus purposely and systematically on those that have been neglected, oppressed, marginalized, deprived of opportunities for economic advancement by consecutive colonial and apartheid governments. In debating this Rural Development and Land Reform budget vote, I am reminded of a seminal observation on the question of land as reflected in the ANC Tactics and Strategy document, which was adopted at its Morogoro Conference in 1969. And let me say, in honoring Oliver Tambu. This is a conference organized and presided over by this giant of a leader, a visionary, a, a unifier, Oliver Reginald Tambu. <laughs> this quote say, it is inconceivable for liberation to have a meaning without a return of the wealth of the land to the people as a whole. I think this is very, very important. Honorable Grunewald, we cannot talk about transformation and land reform without clearly making sure that we return the wealth of the land to the people as a whole. The people as a whole have been marginalized. I have indicated very, very clearly, purposely and systematically over centuries. This, emphasis, Order. this emphasizes the centrality of access to land and land ownership to the quest for economic prosperity. This strategy and tactic document further warns us of the dire consequences we will face if we ignore this fact when it said that freedom must more must be more than political democracy. It must mean the right to, uh, the freedom must be more than uh, what is called political democracy, which does mean the right to vote. The warning is 
to allow the existing economic forces, and that is important. The warning is that if we allow the existing economic forces to retain their interest intact, it is to feed the root of racial supremacy and does not represent even the shadow of liberation. If we leave things on Wong Shengwa unaltered as we have found it in 1994, then surely we have failed uh, this liberation. And therefore, I agree 100% uh, with your call. Um, the restoration of land rights is therefore a critical task of this government and a core mandate of this department led by Honorable uh, Minister Nkwinti. Honorable members, comrades and friends, instructively, the ANG National Executive Committee through our President, His Excellency uh, Jacob Zuma at, the, at our uh, 105th anniversary this year in Soweto uh, told us, it is time, and I quote, it is time to return the land to our people. The President went further and acknowledged the progress made in land reform and land redistribution as led by Minister Nkwinti, his deputies, Masekhu um, Dlamini um, and Comrade Squatsa, but he reminded us that the legacies of apartheid is still very much evident when he said, too many of our people continue to suffer from the historical injustice perpetrated by the horrendous land dispossessions. He called on all of us to demonstrate courage and determination to ensure that the land is returned to the people. Cheers. We all know today that the then 1913 Land Act uprooted and banished the majority of black people to be squeezed in 30%, 13% of the land and through ordinances, dispossession, dispossess descendants from the Koi and the Sun. Uh, Honorable from, member, round up. From the land that they have lived on and the notorious Group Areas Act uprooted and displaced thousands of colored um, uh, families. The question of expropriation without compensation is a matter of serious consideration by us as the ruling party. And as we review all policies uh, in preparation for our 54th National Conference in December, we will certainly look at that uh, also. As the ANC, we must increase the pace of land reform and land redistribution. We must- Honorable Minister, Member, your time is up. We must act, uh, uh, deal with the issue of the Koi and the Sun. Thank you very much. Honorable Member, thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member Madela. I will now call upon Honorable Member C. Dudley. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. The, the NDP, which the ACDP supported, includes activities for creating an integrated and inclusive rural economy. This, we understand, must include the creation of jobs in communal areas, expanding commercial agriculture, making land reform work, developing non-agricultural activities, developing human capital, ensuring social security, food security, and basic services, ensuring farm worker empowerment and labor relations. No small task, Honorable Minister. The ACDP calls on the Minister not to overlook the importance of ensuring that people receive the basic services in the areas where they live. This is important for many reasons, but also important because if we don't, people will be drawn in ever, ever greater numbers to urban areas that are already overstretched in terms of provision of services. On the land question, the ACDP appreciates the vigorous debate within the majority party on this issue and is encouraged that some leaders are not taking lightly the danger of expropriating land without considering food production. ANC Secretary General, uh, for example, has noted that Zimbabwe's failure to value agriculture in its land redistribution has translated into starvation. Land is not just economics, he is quoted as saying, it's a sensitive issue. We want to ensure that th there is better management of it. It's a complex issue. If you play the gallery, you will set the country on fire. We need to manage it better, and the ACDP couldn't agree more. 
Zimbabwe's tourism minister, Walter Mzambi, has also warned of the consequences of taking President Mugabe's route, reportedly cautioning South Africa not to copy Zimbabwe's land reform agenda, saying black business economic empowerment has been more important and successful in South Africa, and he urged South Africa to evolve its own model. According to the National Development Plan, agriculture has the potential to expand and create an additional one million jobs. The ACDP welcomes the move toward government and business making an effort to create sustainable partnerships, partnerships that will provide skills and experience for successful models and part uh, partnership. Of course, we only have to look at the sugar industry, the country's largest agricultural employer. The ACDP is of the opinion that solid rational leadership in land reform and communal tenure security is needed, but we also need Treasury and the Department to actively provide for infrastructure plus financial and technical support to farmers. To get good at anything, you have to do it over and over and over again, and that's a fact. Um, you, have to be, you also have to be good at what you do to just survive, and you must be even better to be competitive. Without support, while skills are being developed, the chances of survival, let alone success, are very slim. According to researchers, beneficiaries of land reform too often remain poor and dependent on state social grants for survival, even many years after land restitution. Inadequate post-settlement support, lack of skills, poor planning, infighting within communities are some of the reasons that despite a strong desire to grow crop crops, um, success is elusive. Honorable member, round up. At the same time, no money well, let me round up by saying, uh, while we understand the challenges of transitional justice, the ACDP is, like, is unlikely to support the budget because of our concern that even the 10 billion will not be adequate to the task if we don't deal with the fraud and corruption involved. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Honorable Member Dudley. I will now call upon Honorable T.M. Babama. Ngozi Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution provides in Section 25.6 that a person or community whose tenure of land is legally insecure as a result of past racially discriminatory laws or practices is entitled to tenure which is legally secure or to comparable redress. Section 25.9 provides that Parliament must enact that legislation. Chapter six of the National Development Plan, which advocates for an integrated and inclusive rural economy states. There will be integrated rural areas where residents will be economically active, have food security, access to basic services, healthcare and quality education. Achieving this vision will require leadership on land reform and communal tenure security, amongst other things, to implement these interventions. A critical and relevant vision indeed, and one that the DA agrees with wholeheartedly. What the commissioners who wrote the NDP did not perhaps realize was that there was and still is no leadership competency in the ANC to implement this plan. Six years down the line, the plan is challenged by delays in legislation, insufficient budgets, bureaucratic bungling, corruption, and incompetent government officials. In June 2016, Kings Welitimi announced plans for those residing on Ingonyama Trust land to be awarded title deeds. The chairperson of the Ingonyama Trust Board later explained that the task would take many years to conclude and would require funds from central government to implement. Strangely enough, there is no provision in their budget to kickstart this initiative. Abantu Basalindi Lenangoku. The ANC's policies on communal land have, like their economical policies, benefited a narrow political elite of traditional leaders at the expense of the rural masses. In her July 2014 article titled Communal Land, Property Rights and Traditional Leaders, Annika Klaassens states that the present ANC government has rejected the post-94 rights-based approach to land reform in favor of outsourcing power and control over 17 million plus South Africans to traditional leaders in a context where power relations are notoriously unequal. 
These unequal power relations have resulted in rural residents being taken advantage of and deals made on their land by some corrupt and unscrupulous traditional leaders who see opportunities for self-enrichment. Often, unelected and illegitimate traditional elites have acted unilaterally, authorizing mining activities on communal land without consulting their communities. Why does the ANC insist on denying rural communities their land rights? A decisive and efficient DA government will fast track communal tenure legislation and start off by securing tenure rights to the dispossessed rural dwellers in the former TBVC Order. territories. In a DA-led government, rural residents will be economically Honorable active members, please don't drown as the, the assets they live on will legally belong to them and not the government. Decisions pertaining to the land will not be made for them by traditional authorities in a patriarchal and patronizing system reminiscent of the experiences under an apartheid government. We will forever be grateful to the many individuals who made untold sacrifices to free our beloved country from the shackles of apartheid. We will never forget them. However, it is now time to hand over the baton to a new order, to a Honorable swifter, member, your time is up. more inclusive and forward-looking party, the Democratic Alliance. Thank you, Honorable Member Babama. I will now call upon the Deputy Minister, Honorable Mash uh, KC Mashikotamini. Honorable Chairperson, our Minister, our Deputy Minister, uh, Honorable Member, take your seat. Honorable Member, uh, on what rule are you rising? 91. I think there's a letter missing. Maybe it should have been KFC. <laughs> Your point of order is not sustained. Uh, shall we proceed? Order. Distinguished guests, <laughs> Acting Director General in our management who are present here, fellow South Africans, honorable members. I want to set the scene today with a quote from our first democratic president. I quote, overcoming poverty is not a task of charity. It is an act of justice like slavery and apartheid. Poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by the action of human beings. Sometimes it falls on a generation to be great you can be the great generation. Let your greatness blossom, close quote. In May 1994, with an aggression of the first democratic president, our fight to restore the dignity of South Africa begins. This went down in history as the most significant in our mind and the world at large. It is the day that changed the political landscape of our country and the world. Indeed, Chairperson, we have moved miles since 1994 to become one of the respected democracies in the world. As we work towards the rebuilding of our country after decades of colonialism of a special type and statutory apartheid, which brought hatred, division, and racism amongst the people of one flesh and one blood. These words still resonate in our mind and influence our it's thinking as we progress in the total liberation of our people. On the 11th, May 2016, we presented our departmental budget vote, clearly indicating what we will do to address the triple, the triple challenge of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Honorable Chairperson, in the 2016-17 financial year, the department has implemented 179 animal and felt management projects, seven River Valley Catholic project, 69 social economic, and 53 agri-park related infrastructure project. The implementation of these infrastructure projects has had significant impact in our rural communities by creating 1,574 jobs, 
employing 422 women and 911 youth. The project impacted in 22,194 households. The targets for 2017-18 is to create 3,612 jobs through the infrastructure project. Honorable members, one of the key initiatives announced in the 2015 State of the Nation address was the AgriPark program. I am pleased to announce that significant progress has been made to date. The AgriPark program seeks to improve production by smallholder farmers, improve access to market and engagement in the agricultural value chain. Honorable Chairperson, three agri hub are already operational in Ngoha, Springbok Pan, and Western area. There are currently 11 additional agri hub in the 44 district where construction is taking place. These are in Butterworth, and Abatoy is under construction. Farmers in the surrounding areas are being mobilized to supply red meat to the Abatoy. In Ngoha, the fencing and irrigation infrastructure has been constructed. In Tabanju, the Abatoy has been upgraded, the access road has been regraveled, and the boundary fences have been completed. The Springbok Agri Hub in the Harib district is being developed and the fencing and water connection have been completed. Honorable President recently visited the Western Area Agri Park. This facility includes state-of-the-art vertical hydroponic tunnels as well as pack house and training facility among other supporting infrastructure. In Bushpark Ridge, a pack house and cold storage facility will become fully operational this financial year. In Dr. J. S. Mroka Municipality within the Gagala District Municipality, a fresh produce market is completed and the facility will become fully operational this financial year. In the Capricorn Agri Hub, the provincial government has completed the religious pack house dryer for the black farmers. In Noadi, pack house is under construction and on completion in the current financial year. In Ceres, we have completed the upgraded road and electrical supply. In Springbok Pen, 3,950 hectares of sunflower maize were harvested and taken to the silos. To date, 249 jobs have been created and 61 farmers have been supported in this area. In the 2016-2017 financial year, the implementation of the Animal Field Management Program resulted in 2,359 community members being trained in basic field firefighting, creating a fire breaks, re-engineering soil rehabilitation, debushing, and first aid. 1,440 of the community members trained were women and 1,575 were youth. 10 were people with disability. In 2016-17 financial year, the department implemented seven River Valley catalytic projects to vitalize four irrigation schemes on 2,000 hectares in Wazulu Natali and Pumalanga. These include Ndumo, Mtandeni, Buffer Spray, Fig Tree, Matadeni schemes. In this financial year, the Rural Infrastructure Unit has prioritized to implement 120 projects supporting production in the 44 Agri Park at a value of 264 million. To support the revitalization of rural towns and villages, the department in 2016-17 year completed the Western Cape, the upgrading of gravel road, walkaway, and construction of stormwater system in Kasibai. This project was implemented to provide access to launch boat at the harbor and to control stormwater. Furthermore, 1.2 kilometer road were paved. In 2017-18 financial year, 30 social economic infrastructure project will be completed at the investment of 252 million, which will result in creating 2,580 jobs. Skills development is an important component of the radical social economic transformation. And to this end, will skill 1,480 rural people as part of the Rural Disaster Mitigation Program. The department, Chairperson, has also implemented the Rural ICT Program. In 2016-17 financial year, we delivered 
learners' infrastructure to 44 schools in all provinces, supporting more than 10,000 learners to provide access to latest education technology and teaching aid, respectively. The purpose of this project is to identify and deploy cost-effective educational ICT technology to rural communities. Honorable Chairperson, youth development and employment is the cornerstone of economic transformation. Since 2010, the department has implemented a National Rural Youth Service Corps program. In 2016-17 financial year, the NARISEC program recruited 2,700 youth from all nine provinces aligned to the Agri-Park. This will ensure that the youth are skilled in the essential skills required to participate in the enterprise and industrial opportunities to operationalize the agri-parks. In the 2017-18 financial year, we'll be investing 427 million to recruit 2,700 new youth and graduate 2,132 youth in various essential skills programs. <laughs> Honorable Chairperson, we should mention that Taban Junarese College is now fully operational and being upgraded as we speak. It is becoming a center for skills development that is not only servicing the NARISEC program, but the widespread public. In 2016-17, the department has supported rural enterprise aligned in agricultural policy action plan and the industrial policy action plan. A total of 161 enterprises were supported within the red meat, grain, cotton, poetry, wool, gold, and horticulture value chain. With this project, we have facilitated the creation of 4,690 jobs opportunities, which has resulted in increased income generation for the community. Honorable involved. Deputy Minister, round up. Honorable Chairperson, in arts and craft, we need to indicate that we have finished to establish our cooperative bank our people are now banking their money in their own bank as cooperatives. We are also want to indicate that we are supporting a young girl who is present here called Fezile Koza, who have established his Fezas Pizza of its own kind. We have set aside 600,000 to support the pizza. Honorable member, your time is I up. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Honourable Minister. Chair. Honorable Chair, the side. May I address you in terms of Rule 84? I did not rise earlier on as a show of respect to yourself and the Deputy Minister. Honorable Filtani rose on a frivolous point of order. And he said the Deputy Minister must be referred to as the KFC. And in terms of Rule 84, that is insulting, disrespectful, unbecoming, and unparliamentary. <laughs> Unfortunately, in your ruling, you did not say he must withdraw. So I want him to withdraw that reference to the minister as okay. KFC. Okay. Well, Honorable, Honorable Whip, Immediately after uh, Honorable Member Filtane rose, I actually ruled that that was not a point of order. So which means there is already an existing ruling, but in future, if you rise, can you rise immediately after the point of order? Thank you very much. Order. Order. Honorable members, we will now move to Honorable Member N.W. Magadla. Hmm. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister Winty, and two Honorable Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Chairperson 2017 is the year to celebrate the life of Oliver Reginald Tambo, who was the champion of political liberation and economic emancipation for the people of South Africa. This was also reiterated by President Jacob Zuma 
during the State of the Nation Address in February 2017. During the State of Nation Address, President Zuma also calls for radical economic transformation, which means fundamental change in the structure, systems, institutions, patterns of ownership, management, and control of the economy in favor of all South Africans, especially the poor. As the ANC, we therefore see 2017 as a year to strengthen the program of radical socioeconomic transformation in memory of our heroes. The ANC has made this decision because South African citizens are growing impatient with the slow pace of economic transformation, which has left the majority trapped in poverty and economic disempowered. This is more evident in rural areas where the majority of the poor are found. CRTP, in 2009, our government initiated CRTP, that is Comprehensive Rural Development Program, to address the scout of poverty in rural areas. The CRTP contributes towards outcome seven of the medium term strategic framework for 2014 up to 2019, which emanates from the ANC's manifesto and the National Development Plan. This outcome seven is to create vibrant, equitable, and sustainable rural communities with food security for all. Through the implementation of the CRTP, infrastructure for basic services has been provided in rural areas for provision of electricity, water, and sanitation, as well as building of clinics, houses, roads, community halls, multi-purpose centers, and so forth. The CRTP has also contributed to food security through the establishment of household and community gardens in rural areas. Agriparks, Chairperson Siakobasun Kulumendo Kokelo and Congolos. Agriparks have been established in all 44 districts, district municipalities, which said to revitalize agriculture and agro processing in the country. Agriparks is an initiative by government to facilitate rural economic transformation in order to ensure the creation of sustainable jobs and also empowering rural communities and smallholder farmers to be part of the agricultural value chain in line with the National Development Plan. Since the inception of Agriparks, as Deputy Minister has indicated, Three agri-hubs are operational, which are Ngoha in the Eastern Cape, Springbok Pan in Northwest, and Western area in Gauteng. These are expected to bring investment and create a class of black smallholder farmers and producers linked to markets in those selected poor areas. Approximately 10,566 smallholder farmers have been identified to benefit from agriparks, and 69,692 hectares of land has been distributed. Nancy once household one hectare program was launched in October 2015, the main purpose of the program is to promote food security and improve rural livelihoods through allocating land to selected beneficiaries of subsistence farming, while the bigger plan is to transform rural economy. Householders supported to produce for consumption needs and organized into primary cooperatives linked to the agriparks initiatives. As an extension to the one horse household one hectare program, the Department of Rural Development and Rural Reform introduced the one hectare two dairy cows initiative in which each household in dairy producing areas is given two cattle to contribute to the production of dairy Products. The Nara Sheikh was launched in September 2010 and has been rolled out in all provinces. Honorable Lengwa, 
as we have indicated, the department is trying with all its uh, muscles to improve NARSEC with its small budget. In conclusion, Chairperson and members, it is clear that this budget speaks to the needs of RAD people and aims at empowering them to participate in the economy of the country. Therefore, the ANC supports budget vote number 39. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. I'll now call upon Honorable Member Walters. Chairperson, I would like to start by extending a genuine thanks to the Minister for acknowledging the DA's successes in land reform in the Western Cape and also our critique of the reopening of the land claims process. Chairperson, this budget vote debate is presenting a choice in our country that needs to be unpacked for any discussion on land reform to be genuinely meaningful. How we deal with this choice can deeply affect the lives of South Africans in the years to come. What we do in this parliament is the difference between a dream coming true or not, of real people having futures or not, a family going hung hungry or not. It's not a game and real lives are involved. It is our duty as an opposition party and also as an alternative, go alternatively governing party to strongly challenge assumptions and highlight the choice between alternatives that is being made. We also do so looking at this moment and its choices through the prism of a, a core set of values. The Democratic Alliance has as the, as, at, at the core of its belief system the belief in the individual. Before you are part of a class, race, color, or eth ethnicity, you are an individual. For us, it therefore stands to reason that unless we do changes that lives, to ch to make changes that do it, make a difference in the lives of individuals, anything else is, is mere layers of obfuscation standing in the way of change. Advancing individuals in non-destructive tandem with one another is synonymous with progress. It's about freedom, fairness, and opportunity. All of this, of course, must be done in a contextually intelligent manner which takes into account our particular history and what shapes the lives of individual, especially the forgotten rural poor. In short, Honorable Chair, we make our choices and judge this budget and its concomitant legislation based on the extent to which it advances these values. This budget is meant to support a flurry of legislation coming to us that also provides further, con further context to what we are doing. That can briefly be summarized as follows. It aims to limit land ownership in order to expand the role of the state. The upcoming regulation of agricultural land holdings bill is essentially aimed at dumping a lot of land on the market in the belief that that will advance access to the land and advance the poor. It aims to secure a privileged position for the state as an operator, price setter, purchaser, and distributor of land. The new draft regulation for the valuation of land aim at setting a standardized land pricing system towards this objective. All of this is superficially founded on a belief that the state is the vehicle of change in society and our budgets are also being led by these assumptions. Chair, these assumptions are not borne out by the facts and we believe the underlying problems are simply being sidestepped. The same ANC government who wants more power and more control have shown that it's the very reason why land reform is failing and we cannot have more of the same. It's not that we are going too fast. The government is going too fast for the people. The people are waiting for the government. More than 80 billion rand has largely been wasted in commercial rural land, a uh, commercial rural land market estimated at the size of 192 billion. Billions and billions were lost each year by the ANC government that could have been spent on land reform, and wasteful expenditure, fiscal dumping without meeting targets, and of course the ANC's perennial bed partner, corruption. The government blames the willing buyer, willing seller principle, but the truth is that the acquisition is so mismanaged that it often takes years to process sales. A massive failure rate of creating successful farming ventures exists. In 2011, this government had a 90% failure rate in its land reform ventures. It improved to this in this term on the face of it to what the ANC is proud of, a 73% failure rate when recap funding was used to support failing projects. Of course, not inherently dealing with the problem, but simply throwing money at what are essentially becoming state-supported farms. The ANC did nothing to ensure title deeds, or at least proper long-term tenure secured for occupants of state <coughs> or communal land. This prevents the rural poor from accessing opportunities in the marketplace, and making these desperately poor forgotten areas prosper and attra attractive investment. 
The same applies to beneficiaries of land reform that are in truth exploited labor on inefficient state-owned farms without title deeds. A state interested in advancing the poor and having individuals <coughs> advance themselves would not have underfunded, delayed, and politically abused land claims, land claims as the recent constitutional court finding in this regard underscores. Ask land claimants who have been waiting for their claims to be resolved since the late 90s. Today, beneficiaries without ownership of land are, reliant, are still reliant on support by strategic partners chosen by a government more interested in helping its cronies advance themselves than interested in supporting beneficiaries achieve their dreams. Ask the beneficiaries of Novanda Farm in the X River Valley how they benefited from their strategic partner, a close and should I say safe ally and funder of the ruling party. It's now clear that the ANC prefers to keep the poor from owning property, stealing their futures, sustaining the colonial and apartheid practice of keeping the poor dependent on government. It uses poverty and state largesse as mechanism to maintain a voting bloc for itself. We cannot therefore accept that somehow the very state that has shown itself as the single biggest enemy of the poor is the vehicle of change. Now government is intending to introduce legislation and regulations that will destroy the value of land, potentially ruin our financial sector, not only on our agricultural sector, and drive away the internal, uh, internal external investment, again, destroying hopes and dreams. It tries to provide political cover by stoking racial division, France, Nord, West Premier, stereotyping commercial farmers as, as the obstacle, and creating lightning conductors from their failure, even if those lightning conductors in truth doesn't exist. There's a real choice that can be made because successful land reform is happening. The Democratic Alliance challenges ANC governments to emulate our successes and share equity schemes with between a 60 and 60 percent of the member, your time has expired. Based on win win partnerships, if we can follow the DO Metro's example, Honorable Member, your time has expired. Of title deeds to the poor. We believe the poor should own. Honorable land. Member, your time has expired. The next speaker is the Honourable Mguni. House Chair, thank you. Uh, Honourable Minister, Deputy Ministers, Honourable Members, led by the Chair of the Committee, Members of the House, uh, our guests, good morning. I was still listening. Uh, it's a pity the Honourable Walters before me had his time up. I will back it next time he gets about 100 minutes. I wanted to really listen to him and what his party has to offer. I was really grappling, though, to, to really get him. Let's start with the, the individual rights. As far as I have known, let's go back to history. We meet a lot, me and you, almost every week. It was the ANC that said at negotiations, no, we cannot agree to group rights. All we can agree to is individual rights because by securing the rights of the individual, you automatically secure the rights of the group. Remember when your predecessor had negotiations, uh, when your predecessors had negotiations, they wanted to tie us down to, 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 to minority rights. I do know that uh, you still hold profoundly the notion of minority rights. To our people, let's admit two things at home, everywhere else, as the ANC. We agree that uh, the pace of transformation has been very, very slow insofar as land reform. We take responsibility to the extent that uh, we are responsible for that, but to a great extent, it's a complex issue. It's correct what Honorable Dudley, Dudley of the ACDP said here. It's a very, very complex field with, a, with, a, with its own landmines. So we take responsibility. However, you are comparing 360 something years with uh, 23 years. You expect the damage that was done by the white colonialists to have been wiped out and all land restored and uh, restituted in 23 years. To a very great extent, it is a myth. It would not have happened. We take responsibility. We apologize to our people. We think that uh, we may have been slow. But we do persuade our people that no party could have done better. We know the array of parties in the House and anywhere else. 
The second area on which we unreservedly apologize to our people is the area of corruption. And we do put ourselves in line. I do offer in the committee the services of the chair, my own services as the whip in that committee. If you pick up issues of corruption, please report to us. I will give examples of corruption we have confronted even in the committee. Dr. Mangojwa sits at Lusigisigi. He is a farmer also in his own right and talent and passion. He buys a farm in, um, he is in the process of buying a farm in Cork State. And all of a sudden, the department buys that farm at one million rands more than the price that Dr. Mangojwa was going to buy via the commercial banks for that matter. Clearly, we have a case of corruption. We are following it. We have spoken to the minister and to the department about it. We think that it was very, very unfortunate and unfair. It's not the ANC. It, 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 it is then happening somewhere in the corridors of the machinery. Remember, DA, you said we may not deploy cadres. So somewhere in administration, we've got just free travelers who probably come from your ranks, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, allow us to deploy every public service administration cadre ourselves. Then we'll deal with corruption. <laughs> On corruption, Honorable Stein, just listen, you will like this. On corruption, an emerging timber producer at Umzimkulu buys or seeks to buy via the state support, seeks to buy a timber farm in Harding. And then in the process, one nameless official, we are following this, we will give you a report. One nameless official comes all the way from Pretoria and says to him, Che talked about Inchoncho, a bribe, and says to, 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 to that person, please, Give us one million, we'll facilitate your obligation. Now, the department is here, the department is listening. They know we have taken up that issue, and we do so. That is corrupt. That emerging timber farmer who took pensions, was serving in the state, took his pension and bought all the equipment, needs to be assisted. We have talked about this. The minister is aware, acting DG, and everyone else is aware. On corruption out there, let when the story is told that the ANC is corrupt, let it be told that, but we've had the ANC voices standing up very loudly against corruption. We cite cases, give us more cases, and we will deal with those cases of corruption. Order, honorable members. Order, unless honorable unless members. if you ask for the Order. impossible, unless if you ask for the impossible, you have heard voices from within the ANC support clearly the commission of uh, the Judicial Commission of Inquiry, Honorable IFP, you talk about the Guptas. But Guptas and capture, capture is very deep. The syllabus you studied, I suspect, Honorable Tlengwa, you studied the syllabus that captured you and promoted your mentality towards capitalist Honorable lines. Mguni, will you take your seat, please? Honourable Schlenger, take Will your the seat. Take a now, why I, are you rising, honourable member? Will the member take a question? Honourable Mguni, are you prepared examples. to take a question? After I I, 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 I finish, I will honour. I, I mean, uh, I will Thank gladly you, member. accept. Take your seat, honourable member. Take your seat, honourable member. Honourable, take your seat. Write me a note as I speak. Honourable Mguni, honourable Mguni, take your seat, please. There's another point of order. Why are you rising, honourable member? As I rise, the members are sitting in the house. But let me add this, the curriculum I What is the point of order? Was developed by the that ANC. is a point of debate, honorable member. So Take your seat. Your curriculum. Take your seat. Continue, honorable member. <laughs> the ANC is so powerful. It is there in the tech, in universities and everywhere. It taught honorable Tlengwa. So you are a student and a product of the ANC, honorable Tlengwa. Come back home then. We will welcome you. Honorable House Chair, whenever we stood up here, we have traced we have traced the issue of land back to colonialism. And Honorable Matias, you didn't do badly. I think it's because your commander-in-chief and others were not here. 
You are right in the Marxist co uh, text you really quoted here. We, we, we really agree uh, firmly with the better part of what you said. Save though that you had to say certain other things that you know are ultra left and not uh, uh, practically applicable. We have always traced the land question to colonialism and colonialism to its father, ideological father, imperialism. Why would Simon van der Stel come all the way to South Africa? Because he was seeking ground and, and, and land to actually exploit as part of the imperialist agenda. DA, please talk to us about imperialism whenever you get a chance, because we, we suspect you don't even know imperialism exists. Imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, by the way. We've always stood here, house chair, and taught to everyone and to our people and to the opposition parties that uh, apartheid itself dislodged our people insofar as land, the group areas act, and so forth, but we have characterized it as having a legacy of three features which remain to date, the race, class, and, 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 and gender. Some have been asked to really wrap up a, a, a discussion so far as the ANC component of them. Some now, it's fashionable in the opposition parties to call on the ANC, conscience, this conscience, this conscience that. We just want to advise you that if you vote on any bill on any matter on conscience, it is your issue. We in the ANC vote on consciousness. Consciousness is that which defines that you have to have a liberation movement. The liberation movement has got to be a vanguard. Its vanguard role has got to fulfill one, two, three tasks of the NDR. And therefore, in the ANC now and any other time, call on us to vote on our consciousness. It's not English, by the way. Some of you are English first language speakers. It's not English. It's politics. We vote on consciousness. We dare not liquidate our vanguard. Small difference for you just to go back and think and, and, and to learn. Your conscience you are talking about is about subjectivity, my feeling. Our consciousness is about objectivity, the highest form of reflection of matter. You, 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 you talk to us about conscience. Under conscience, you liquidate. Under our consciousness, under our consciousness, we assert the authority of the vanguard and we liberate true solidarity. Under your conscience, you know no sacrifice, you may not sacrifice. Under our consciousness, we sacrifice to the end like the biblical Abraham who was prepared to sacrifice. We make the supreme sacrifice like Solomon Matangu, like all other heroes of Umkondo Oasis of the ANC, of the SACPA on Kosatu. So we vote on consciousness. The political basis for conscience is not known. We in the ANC talk about consciousness and the political basis is to advance our own agenda, the National Democratic Revolution. Now, the 6% of our Honorable uh, uh, Matthias, we rejected it. We told you the reasons. We're not about some Zimbabwe style thing. Go to your social media and to media now, you'll find that the minister at the press conference in the morning, and even while he stood here earlier before me, he made it clear that we're not going the route of land grabs. We're not appeasing these ones next to you. You are the ones who appease them and give them power everywhere. We, 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 we are not appeasing them. We are not gonna give them power. They represent our strategic opponents. We only sit and seek to persuade you. Go back to, to Honorable Floyd Shibambo and Commander. I think the think tank there is Floyd. Ne? Go back to Honorable Shibambo and say to them, we think that when you have got power to dish, dish to your big brother to the ANC. It has taught you, it has developed you. It has given you all that you have. Even as EF, it's just that small ultra-left inclination of yours. Other than that, your political basics seems to be our own political basics. Going forward, Chair, we will and we are, we hear that there is a critical uh, objection, uh, Honorable Walters, your colleague would rather not disturb you here, now there's a response. That uh, the restitution, uh, the restitution uh, you, you seem to be having problem to reopening. People who are displaced, that's what you said here. 
Okay, thank you. We are all agreed we will reopen restitution. One of our own is working Honourable on a draft Member, bill to reopen restitution. We thank you. The ANC supports the bill. I now call upon the Honourable the Minister of Rural Development and Land Reform to close this debate. <laughs> thank you, Honourable Chair. Honourable Chair, let me first of all thank you, thank all, all the honourable, honourable members. members. Let me thank all the honourable members who spoke here, in, all of them with no exception. Thank you very much. We, 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 we accept your criticism and we appreciate your, your, your support. Uh, the, yes, we have established a chief directorate from the 1st of April, Honourable Chair of the, of the Portfolio Committee in the question of the farm dwellers. We have established a, a, a chief directorate uh, from the 1st of March to deal directly and focus on this matter. The, the question of title deeds is, is, is true. Problem is, when we started the department in 2009, uh, already we had lost 5% of land which had been bought and, re and, and redistributed to people. They, they, they went to the banks, they, including the land bank, by the way. They couldn't service the debt. Land was taken back. By who? Same white people from whom the land had been purchased. And by the time we started the department in 2009, there were 14 farms which were about to be auctioned by the land bank. We put in 208 million rands immediately to stop that, we saved them. That money is still with the land bank because we are watching, we are guarding this and we said, we're not giving title deeds until we, we stabilize this land reform pro, uh, matter. Yes, we, with regards to the, yes, Honorable Robinson, we have established a, a policy Research and Development Unit headed by PDG Swartz. We moved him from, from RAID, and that's, 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 a, that's one of the things we've just done. And uh, we, now, you know, uh, Honorable Matthias, um, you quoted Macomb and others. You know what, the one big mistake that Makanda Kangwele did uh, in 1819, he sent message to the British colonialist armies at Fort England, what is Fort England today, to say to them, I'm going to have breakfast with you tomorrow. He didn't realize that he was giving them a tip that he was going to attack, and he attacked, and they, we lost. So, um, <laughs> thank you, Honorable Shangwa. We, 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 we take your point there very well. Yes, the university, we've asked the University of Zululand. There's a unit there, a research unit. They are researching the final, um, the old claims, so that we finalize the the research and then we can finalize those. They, they're doing that, that's one of the things that's raised by the uh, Honorable Kubisa. The, yeah, but lastly the <laughs> Honorable, Honorable Chair, the, the land audit, we've just concluded land audit phase two, it's before cabinet right now, a, a copy of the report will be, will be circulated to the Honorable Members as soon as it's concluded. But the, the last thing is the, the Honorable, the Honorable Walters, uh, uh, I, I like him by the way, uh, Pumi. Yeah. He's, he, talks about, he talks about individualism. And uh, there's a clash of cultures here. You see, because uh, I don't know how the Honorable Mbabama is, what is, it teach, what is, what is she teaching uh, the Honorable Walters here? You know, because she comes from a communalism, uh, 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 you know, uh, basis. So there's a clash of cultures here, you know. So, <laughs> you know, you know we, we have, we've got this culture that we own things collectively. But these are neoliberalists that say, well, the individual is supreme. It's even more supreme than the collective, etc. I don't know how the honorable members who come from communal, collective culture, or communalist culture, not communism, not communism, communalism. Yes. So, so there's a clash of culture. The honourable, you know what, you know what? Uh, there's this one small thing. The honourable Mbaba, honourable Mbaba, listen to this. You, you know, it's a friendly, it's a friendly one. You know this guy. You know this this young lady who was called Nongaus. One big trick that the colonists did. They knew that uh, Africans um, were very sensitive about water. The, the, the rivers, etc. So what they did, they climbed on a tree and they, they, they stood there and they said, burn all your things because your ancestors will come back and 
They were looking at when they were taking, getting water from the, from the river, they saw this picture of this white man there. And they went back and they said, we've seen our ancestors. They say we must burn uh, all the food and must uh, kill this livestock, etc." That is, that, is, that is what Nong Nausa did. Eh? So, so be careful, be careful of this. These guys, <laughs> be careful. Um, but thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Members, that concludes the debate and the business of the session, and the money plenary will now rise. Thank you.